Hello, I'm Roger Woods with the Wald Lake Church of Christ, and I'm so glad that you've joined me, as well as many from my congregation who are watching today. We will be partaking of the Lord's Supper at the end of the sermon, so if you would like to participate, please have your supplies ready. As we begin, please sing with me the great hymn, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. All that we have, or will have, or might have everything are gifts from God. And we should seek to live our lives so that God is given the glory and not ourselves. Paul reminds us in Romans, the third chapter, verse 23 and 24, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What a great blessing. And this blessing should draw us closer to him so that we can better know this God whose love is better than life. Last week, we looked at the importance of faith, finding true north in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How key that is for navigating our journey through this life and into eternity. Once we are oriented to true north, well, then we can journey through life and on to our eternal home, no matter what the obstacles are that may get in our way. Making sure to take the right bearings is also important. You see, each one of the cardinal compass points are very important for us. God is not calling us to a blind faith as we navigate spiritually through life. Well, that will only put us all in the ditch, right? Rather, God wants us to have a confident faith which trusts the power of God rather than our own strength and understanding. So as we explore each core doctrine in this series, let it be our faith, our informed faith, that guides us, that directs us to the destination we intend to arrive at, which, of course, is heaven. By knowing our cardinal doctrines, and using an informed faith, properly oriented, we will reach our goal. Today, I want to explore the doctrine of God. In his 2010 book, Dug Down Deep, Joshua Harris shares a story to illustrate the importance of accurate information when it comes to following God. Harris writes about a girl he once knew who used to think that the stars were tiny specks of light just out of reach over your head. I'm not kidding, he writes. And she wasn't in grade school when she believed this. She was in college. She was a really sweet, kind redhead who spoke almost perfect Spanish. She was intelligent in many ways. But one day in a conversation, she mentioned that she had just learned that the stars in the night sky were actually very far away. I asked her, Harris writes, what she meant. She said, you know, they're just right up there. They're just tiny dots. They're really far away. I was incredulous, he admits. I then asked her, what did you think they were before you knew they were far away? She replied, I thought they were, you know, just right above our head, just past our reach. Harris then makes this connection to understanding God. If you were to ask me, writes Harris, why it matters that we study the doctrine of God, I say for the same reason that it's worth knowing that stars are not tiny pinpricks of light just above our heads. 
When we know the truth about God, it fills us with wonder. If we fail to understand his true character, we'll never be amazed at him. We'll never feel small as we stare up at him. We'll never worship him as we ought. We'll never run to him for refuge or realize the great love he's shown and the measureless distance that he bridged to rescue us. Paul's benediction at the end of Romans chapter 11 is a beautiful expression of the greatness of God. There he writes, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This really puts us in our place. At least it does me. His paths are beyond tracing out. That doesn't mean they're unknowable. Simply that we, in and of our own cognitive powers, cannot discover them. Now, this is the danger in many types of apologetics. That we create proofs of God from below as if they were from above. There is no doubt that God has left clues for us in nature. But ultimately, God is the initiator of all revelation, natural or scriptural. Now, we cannot counsel God. We cannot tell him how things are. But we can come to know his greatness. And if we will, by faith, let him guide us. But let's face it. God has created us to be intelligent, free, moral agents. Curiosity is built into our nature. Sadly, our curiosity, as often as not, leads us into blind alleys, all because we rely on human sight rather than on the eyes of faith. This mysterious but knowable God is so much better than the one-dimensional ideas of the divine which we often work with. Now, we could do a whole series on the doctrine of God alone, but I will limit our scope today to a few of the representative misconceptions about him and contrast them with the biblical doctrine of God. This is important. You see, just as the young woman's ignorance about the universe kept her from the wonder and majesty of the cosmos, our ignorance about God keeps us from truly knowing fully his majesty, the full majesty, Father, Son, and Spirit. In Western civilization, around the time of the Enlightenment, which roughly covers the 1700s, exploration of our world by reason reached its full flower. In particular, Enlightenment thought emphasized the use of reason, individualism, skepticism, and science alone, rather than faith to explain the natural and supernatural world. The leading figures of this time were deeply influenced by this movement. Though not inherently agnostic, antagonistic to belief in God, the Enlightenment was certainly more focused on a human-centric explanation of the world. And it was out of this movement that the idea of the watchmaker God grew. It was not a new idea, but one that through the Enlightenment has become deeply embedded in our culture. The technical name for this is deism. It describes an all-powerful but impersonal and non-involved deity who makes a watch the universe winds it up, and then walks away and let it sit wind down on its own. Oh, occasionally he might observe something broken and tinker with it, but he has other more important things to do than constantly look after the universe, much less little old me on little old earth. Now this was a leading theology among several of our nation's founding fathers. So you see, understanding biblical doctrine about God is important even for understanding earthly documents like our U.S. Constitution. Phrases we may interpret one way may have not been their original intent. The most famous of these Enlightenment-influenced founding fathers was Thomas Jefferson, the writer of the Constitution and our third president. 
Jefferson had little use for the Christian religion, except for the ethical and moral teachings of Jesus. Look up the Jeffersonian Bible someday and get a better idea of his thoughts. Indeed, these ideas have been filtered down unknowingly into our modern culture and our, re our religious values today. You see, the influence of the Enlightenment even today in many of the ideas we bring to church with us each Sunday. For example, have you ever heard someone say that God is just too busy to concern himself with my little old problems? That's a lightly cloaked version of deism that robs God of many of the characteristics the Bible tells us are his. Jesus in Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 26, instructs the crowd listening to him about the true nature of the Lord. He says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Jesus declares to us all a God who is not only interested in humanity, the crowning achievement of his creative acts, he's also interested in the birds of the air, the grass of the field, and more. To say that God is not interested in our affairs is more a product of our culture than it is of biblical faith. Indeed, letting our ideology dictate our theology obscures the very God we say that we are worshiping. Not only does it rob us of the help we can receive from God, it leads us into practices that God hates. This type of thinking reminds me of idolatry. Now, we often think that for one to be an idolater means that you have to worship an actual idol. This is a false notion. Idolatry and its basic tenets is our effort to force the deity to do what we want. I see this especially in many of the health and wealth gospels trumpeted by Christians today. It's usually laid out as a formula. If you give me 10% or more, God will, really must, give you 10 times more. Or, if you have faith, God will heal your illness. Lack of a cure points to lack of faith. Or, if our nation will turn to God, like we used to be, then all our problems will go away. Now, let me be clear. I am not saying that you should not give to your church or to the poor. Nor am I saying that we should not be praying for healing or for our nation. But if you are basing your prosperity, health, and national greatness on getting a formula right, you're barking up the wrong tree. Remember last week we talked about the role of faith versus works. Legalism, folks, is a sign of idolatry. When you read Romans, you will discover that Paul's criticism of the law of Moses was not of the law itself, but rather of the legalistic and, adult and idolatrous way that it was being applied. Sadly, I see many similar ideas in Christianity today, especially surrounding teachings on the end of the world. This type of theology shows me that we are not really wanting to emulate Christ in our lives. Why do I say that? Because that type of theology is always trying to avoid suffering. As if we believe that suffering is unnatural and certainly unspiritual. Again, I'm not a masochist. I don't enjoy getting hurt. But I do know that the Christian walk with God will involve suffering. Indeed, if God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, Romans 8, verse 32, why do we think that we will not suffer? Indeed, Paul desired to participate in the sufferings of Christ so that he could also participate in the resurrection from the dead, Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11. The good news is that we can get what we want from God and never suffer. Excuse me. The good news is not that we can get from God whatever we want and never suffer. It's that God is with us no matter what we go through. He will give us the good things we need to live for him through faith in his Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I could continue. But I've used these two examples, deism and idolatry, 
because of their strong but often unseen influence in the church today. There are many other ideas about God that rob us of the impact of his greatness and majesty in our lives. In doing that, they also keep us from truly worshiping God and leading others to him through Christ, which is our purpose, the purpose for which we were given new life in Jesus Christ. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 verses 31 and 33 encouraged the church in Corinth to use every opportunity to lift God up in their lives. He writes, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Why? Well, Paul tells us in verse 33, For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Failure to know the true glory and majesty of God not only hurts us spiritually, it can keep others from knowing their Savior. The stakes are high, Christian. We need to be praying for and encouraging each other. Like steel sharpens steel, we need to sharpen our understanding about God by studying His revealed Word together. With our understanding of God clear, we will not only find our way through life, we will save many who are on the wrong path. May the prayer of Paul in Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 16 through 21, be our prayer for the church and the world as well. I pray, writes Paul, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that, you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Next week, we will focus on understanding who Jesus is. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus the Son of God? Of course, we know that he is the ultimate revelation from God the Father. Through him, we are given the indwelling of God in the Holy Spirit. Without his death, burial, and resurrection, we would not know and certainly would not have a hope of being with God. That is why each week we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We gather around the table so that we can remember this great God who loved us so that he gave his only begotten Son. His love for us is another one of the great mysteries of God that are ours in Christ Jesus. He loved us so that he sent his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. For all who will believe in him. As we partake of this bread representing his body and the cup representing his blood, let us accept the free gift that he's given to us. And let us share that good news with all that we meet. As we prepare to take the supper, let's sing a chorus to remind us of the great blessings we share because we are united in Christ. A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, we thank you for your great blessings. We thank you that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, at supper, Jesus took this bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, Eat this bread, 
for it is my body given for you. Father, help us to remember that Jesus offered the sacrifice we could not offer. He paid the ultimate price that we could not pay, that we were not worthy to pay. Through his perfect life offered in our place, you have taken away the offense. The price has been paid, and we are set free. And for this we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let us pray for the cup. Holy God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come around your table and to be able to remember your body given for us on the cross and your blood shed for us on the cross. Your blood that cleanses our sins, that institutes a new covenant, a covenant by which we can cry, Abba, Father. For we are now heirs with Christ of the great promises you have given us. Thank you, Father, for your love, for your forgiveness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yep, they're still growing. They're a little uh, peakish. I think I'm going to have to transplant them soon so they get all the nutrients that they really need. But may God continue to bless you. May you continue to plant seeds in your own heart as well in the hearts of those you meet. God bless you.